Well, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Uh, I was here in Los Angeles at the World Affairs Council not long ago, and it was terrific, eye-opening, uh, what you see, uh, what you do, and I'm very interested in your what's on your mind. I, I'm here to listen and learn as well as present to you uh, some things that are going on in our Navy today. To uh, There's a lot of service out there today. To you, uh, Consul Generals, I want to thank you so much for serving your nation and serving the neighborhood of nations writ large. So many of you, as, I, as we met and we shook hands, uh, I would tell you, you know, I'm, I work with your head of Navy, and it's a, a wonderful fraternal organization, uh, soon to be, uh, if you will, male and female, as we expand our horizons out there and those that lead. What I'd like to do today, uh, again, I take your questions, but I want to sort of set a baseline of uh, what the Navy is, is doing out there. Our, our mandate, when people say, so what's, what does the Navy do? And as I tell anybody, you know, our product is presence. It's forward presence out and around the world, but it, it ha we have to be where it matters, not just anybody, where any place, where it matters, and we have to be ready all the time so that when it matters, we can respond. And as Terry sort of alluded to, uh, Operation uh, Damayan uh, is going on today, and, and we can talk about that. Uh, there in the Philippines, we can talk about that. But first, uh, let's, let's start with just maybe a baseline. Can I have the first graphic there? Uh, some of the things that you may have learned in eighth grade physical science, if not before, hey, there's a lot of water in the world. 70% uh, of our world is covered by, with ocean. 80% of the population of this nation, of this world of ours, lives near the, within 100 miles of an ocean, of water. And that, uh, we, I was talking with uh, some of the high school representatives here today, these smart kids of our leaders of the future, to say, you know, that's an example of the kind of damage that typhoons do. There are so many people that depend on them. And with that in mind, uh, next one, please, 90% of the trade by volume that travels around the world, this economy, world economy of ours, uh, by volume is going by water. And by value, it's 70%. So you can see the, all the different shipping, uh, we call them lines of uh, communication around the world, and we are hyper-connected. Uh, uh, Thomas Friedman told us years ago, the world is flat. He also says we are hyper-connected. So uh, something that influences trade or products or raw material or, or you refine this or that in one part of the world is going to have an influence on the other side. So we need consistent, reliable ocean uh, transportation. Now, if you look at those sites, there are some areas of the world that are what I call crossroads. Some people call them, you call them a straight, a crossroad, uh, whatever you want. Some call them a choke point. But those areas there, now if you're an engineer, you say, well, that's a valve marker, and that's fine. If you're a political science major or a writer, you say, well, that's a bow tie. Uh, you can pick it. But the point is, from the, from the Strait of Gibraltar, as you work your way there to the Suez, Bab el Mendeb Straits, the, the uh, Strait of Hormuz, and of course Malacca, and right near us, the, the Panama Canal. These areas of the world, that, that is where most of the shipping is. Those are the six what I call crossroads. And our job is to be able to be somewhere near or around there. Uh, most, uh, you take uh, just example the Strait of Malacca, 20% of the global oil right through there, uh, here, and uh, it is truly the lifeblood. Uh, for Asia's energy source. The Panama Canal is 5% of the global trade, but it is expanding. Uh, and again, they're widening the, the Panama Canal, some of you know. And we're not really sure just precisely how much uh, influence or how much impact that will have. But the point is, uh, we need to be somewhere near there to, to make sure that the, that the tracks, that the, that the flow through the world uh, goes apace. Next, please. Now. Your Navy has bases here, here, and here. Guam is, in fact, sovereign territory, a base. And that's where we deploy from. But we also have a lot of places around the world, the squares. I spent a good bit of time with my staff, with all my leadership, to assure ourselves that we are nurturing the right relationships near those places, that we are taking advantage of offers that, that some of our allies and at times, ad hoc allies offer us an opportunity that we take that opportunity. For example, uh, Spain has offered us the opportunity, and we've taken them up to put four of our destroyers to base them in Rota, Spain. Uh, and that will be 
our, our sailors, our ships, and their families. Now today, what the, the advantage of that is today, we have 10 destroyers that are earmarked on the east coast of the United States so that we can keep two of them in the Eastern Mediterranean. The Eastern Mediterranean. So that's 10 for the two there. We put four by, in, in Rota, Spain, and, and all of those issues are taken care of. And so there's a great leverage to be able to take a place and forward deploy or forward station some of our ships along with our people. The same uh, offer is taking place here in uh, Singapore. The Singapore government has recently offered us to bring a smaller ship. It's called a literal combat ship. Uh, it's like a, about a 300-foot ship. But they said, why don't you forward station four there? And that gives us leverage right here in the Southeast Asia region. The uh, government of Australia has offered us to forward station to, to deploy Marines in, out of Darwin, not permanently. They, they would just forward uh, deploy there. We would bring our ships and operate Marines in and around the Southeast Asia uh, area, and we've taken them up in that. that. There's a presence that will increase over time uh, through this next decade. Many of you are probably familiar. We have ships in and around uh, Japan and Korea. Uh, places we, we actually station ships in, in uh, Japan, in uh, Yokosuka and in Sasebo, uh, also in Guam, as I mentioned before. But the point here is these squares that you see up there, these places, very important because they enable us to support our Navy around the world. And without it, we would have to rotate from the United States, and that's distance, that's time, and that's key, time and distance. We would not be where it matters when it matters. The last one I would tell you is closer to home, right here in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Yep, we're still in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And as recently as the, the, the Haiti earthquake, we operated out of Guantanamo Bay to provide relief uh, in that situation there. And we operate out of Guantanamo Bay to support counter drug ops here in the Caribbean. And with the Panama Canal change, uh, with increasing traffic, we're not really sure what the security situation will be there. So we have an option there. Okay, next. So, all that being said, where is your Navy? Well, first of all, your Navy today is 285 ships in total. It's more than ships, it's aircraft, it's unmanned uh, vehicles, it's under, unmanned underwater vehicles, aerial, unmanned aerial vehicles, but the predominant measure of the, the size and the state of the Navy is ships. And we have about 100 deployed around the world, 50,000 people. And you can see where they are, the vast preponderance already and we've been this way for a while, are in the Asia-Pacific region. And I was, I was mentioning just a few minutes ago the importance of being able to station forward, to be non-rotational, to if you can have those ships out there all the time and with the crews or rotate the crews, you get great leverage. So that's called non-rotational, and most of the ships we have in the Asia-Pacific are non-rotational. And that's a good thing, because that enables us to be able to respond to a typhoon. That enables us to be able, in days, that enables us to be able to respond to a, a ballistic missile threat from North Korea within 72 hours, establishing a shield for Guam and from the west coast of the United States, because we can operate out of Japan in that particular case. So there's value there. You see about 30% in the uh, Arabian Gulf arena, very important. Uh, some say, well, I don't get it. If, if our energy dependency, our oil dependency in the Arabian Gulf is going down so much, why are we over there? We're over there because we're hyper-connected. So if we got an ally, a friend, a trading partner, and that's the whole Western Hemisphere Plus that depends on that, we've got a, we've got a stake in that, a big stake. So you can see the distribution around the world today and where we are. And you can also see, I just wanted to give you an indication here, is if we're not out there, in about doing what we need to do, how long would it take to get there from, say, the East Coast to the Suez Canal or the Strait of Malacca? A month to get to the Strait of Malacca, two weeks to the Suez Canal. Even in the West Coast of the Strait of Malacca, it's from here, from San Diego, it's three weeks. So we've got to be where it matters, when it matters, so we can respond and get out there. As time evolves, uh, we will increase that presence in the Western Pacific. Our plan right now, subject to uh, budgetary negotiations here and, and deliberations, would be to grow there in the Asia-Pacific region by the end of this decade to 60 ships. 
at any given time out there. And to grow uh, our total deployed from, say, about 100 to about 110 ships by the end of this decade. We have a lot of ships uh, under construction, some down in San Diego, uh, a lot in the Gulf region and, and uh, out there in the East Coast. Uh, but uh, we're, we're a growing Navy for the near term uh, and on, on track to get close to 300 ships here, as you can see, close to 300 ships here by the end of, of this decade. So that just kind of shows you that evolution. And when it's all said and done, where we are and when we are there is important. And the, the presence is there to provide, if I may review, the global economy security, but also to be able to respond to any kind of crisis or threat, missile defense threat, something like that, Syria options for our president, to be able to respond to a disaster such as the typhoon there in the Philippines, to be able to, to ensure that we can get access, that we can go where we need to go, either under the water, on the surface, in the air, in cyber, or in space. So it's about joint access. But we've got to do it efficiently, and we've got to do it effectively. Uh, and so as we build our ships of the future, as we work ahead, we've got to make sure we're paying close attention to what these things cost and that we're buying them efficiently and buying them so that they'll resonate with wh where we need to be and, where we, and, and when we need to be there. So that's kind of the bottom line from the world has a lot of water out there to where we are today to kind of where we're going to kind of emerge to and migrate to in the future. What I'd like to do now is open the floor to questions and then I can go into a different area that, uh, that you may be specifically interested in. Yes, sir. Whoever has the microphone wins, that's all I can tell you. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Admiral. <laughs> I'm Consul General of Japan in the, uh, the presence of the U.S. Navy in the West uh, Pacific or uh, Far East is the key for peace and stability of the region, including Japan. And also the uh, U.S. forces conducted a massive rescue operation soon after the earthquake and tsunami in March 2011. So Japan owes so much to the uh, U.S. Navy. Eventually, me personally, uh, uh, when I was a teenager, I went to a mission school located in Yokosuka. And the, uh, uh, the school was uh, located at the former site of a uh, uh, submarine base of Imperial Navy. So in that sense, uh, I grew up uh, with uh, affinity to Seventh Fleet and the submarine. So with my personal respect and tribute to your career, I'd like to express uh, deep gratitude to the uh, US Navy. And the, uh, my question is, uh, uh, in general term, uh, what, in which aspect uh, you attach the uh, highest priority in modernization of the U.S. Navy? Highest priority? Well, we, the foundation for anything we build and, uh, is our people. So my highest priority today is to be sure that we are uh, growing the force of the future that is motivated that is relevant to the challenge of the future, and it is diverse. And so uh, as I look out at budgetary challenges, that is a concern, but uh, a shift, you know, with a stroke of the pen, we can get more money, and st as long as our industrial base is strong, we can build more ships. But what we've found through the years is, if we don't have the right motivated people in our Navy, and we are continuing to nurture that, it takes decades to build it up and get it right. Uh, we are fortunate today that I am, I am satisfied where we are, but we need to look to cyber in the future. Very, very important that we get that part right. We need to look to unmanned uh, air, um, remote uh, features in the future. Very important that, that we get that right and what it brings on. And we, look, we need to look at uh, future technologies such as laser and uh, electromagnetic spectrum. So we need to grow a force that is relevant and understanding in that regard and build the infrastructure to train them there. The bottom line, it's people. Uh, it's good now, but as our economy turns and grows uh, and we look at the world and the predictability of our scheduling and what we can offer our kids, we make sure that we attract the right youth. 
Yes, sir. I can call on anybody I want, but if she doesn't give somebody the microphone, it doesn't matter. So I'm really not in charge. Uh, thank you. Just, just to kind of follow up on the question that just got asked, um, in light of the sequestration that's occurring and possibly like... Oh, all right. There we go. Um, in light of the uh, sequestration that's occurring, and I guess there's a, even a debate that there will be an addition to it this coming January, and your goal of um, having a 300-ship fleet do you see any particular trade-offs that you're going to have to make in terms of uh, fitting within the coming budget in regards to the um, um, modernization features you just talked about, such as unmanned remote vehicles, uh, the laser and the ele electromagnetic um, um, technologies that you'd like to impose? And so you, you'd like to know what, what kind of laser and what kind of... Yes, I see. Uh, well, you're right. There, there has to be. The, the, the trade-off tends to be uh, the force structure you have today that, that you hold. In other words, the ships, the aircraft we have today. How much of that do we keep and maintain? That's called our capacity. Versus the industrial base and continuing to build in, into the near future and in the science and technology uh, for, that you're bringing in. Uh, and so what I'm finding, I'm focusing a lot more of my effort as we build ships and we build, air, build aircraft, that they not be so expensive and so integrated with today's technology that, that you can't change out payloads. Let me give you a couple examples. How about putting up, uh, put up the literal combat ship? When we built destroyers, uh, say 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they were very integrated, they were very proprietary whenever we built them to whoever put the combat system in, whoever put the sensors in. And it was extremely difficult to swap things out. And in the world we live in today, processing and all that goes on with it, it took the ship to come in and you had to rip out just, just miles of cabling, it seemed. We need a ship that has more volume and speed and is able to go more like payloads. So you look at this and you say, okay, what's the, what's the story here? Go to the next one. The amount of volume inside this ship, and that's all volume too, where you can put different systems here, that door opens there and that door opens right there, where you can put a uh, mine warfare system, anti-submarine warfare system, uh, counter piracy systems in here. You can change out that gun right there with another sensor. A different missile system can go in here. So my point is, go to the next one please. This is the sister ship from the one we just showed. These are called the literal combat ship. We're building 12 of the previous and 12 of this right now. So that's 100 feet wide. Uh, somewhat different, and it's about having space. Next one, please. Volume inside. So that's what the deck looks like underneath, and these are like Connex box sizes. Those are drones, unmanned systems. That's a helicopter there. And then that's a rail where you can launch anywhere from um, unmanned uh, surface vehicles, underwater vehicles, or just uh, speedboats here. And these are out there today. So to me, it's about modularity. Go, go to the uh, rail gun. So we went out to, to look at technology and we said, well, what do you have out there in laser tech? Uh, go, I'm sorry, go to laser gun. What do you have out there? So this is actually a, a laser gun. It, it has a power level that, that allows you to shoot down a drone. So it's kind of slow. Drones are not all that fast. And also it can deal with uh, a speedboat or several speedboats. But the deal with this thing is, and we'll send it out next summer, uh, the 14, uh, on a <laughs> ship in the Arabian Gulf, that, that costs a dollar to, to shoot, if you will, to laze something with this. Uh, I, a, if I shot from uh, our guns on a, on a ship, uh, that costs at least $3,000. Uh, if I shoot any of our missiles, it's uh, either half a million to a million dollars. So although you know, you got to balance this. You're also looking for something efficient in the future. Okay, go to the next one. Now, this is an electronic magnetic, electromagnetic uh, rail gun. And this is, a, uh, <clears throat> this is called a joint high-speed vessel. It used to be a ferry, and they militarized it. A company down in Hobart uh, started building it. And we, built, we have 11 of these. We're going to take one of these in 2016 and put this rail gun. So it's electromagnetic power. And if you, you, it's a big capacitor, and then you 
you have the electromagnetic motive force, and it shoots a slug of metal. So you don't have any magazines. There are no explosives associated. You just stack up these, these items, and for, uh, although $25,000, you say, well, that's pretty expensive, but it can go as far as most of our missiles. It's more precise, and our missiles cost anywhere from a million dollars to, heaven's to Betsy, $20 million. Yes, we do make a $20 million missile. It can do a lot of things. So what is my point here? You gotta balance the thing, you gotta look to the future, you gotta go more to modularity, and, and it's more about payloads than it is the platform itself being the end state. Uh, make the ships more able to move, get where you need to get, and then let industry and challenge industry and, and our technology uh, to put in new kind of systems and sensors. Admiral, thank you for coming, and thank you for protecting all of our freedoms. Uh, to continue on that, we have newspapers, television, talking about the new aircraft carrier, Gerald Ford. And my question is, we don't know if we're getting tainted information or misguided information. Can you tell us a little bit what caused this to have an overrun, and then what they're asking for now to complete this? Sure. The uh, It's expensive, and I... I tell you, um, we can't afford an aircraft carrier. It's the first of a class. Let, let me back it up a minute. It's the first of a class, so I'll give you that. Those are always more expensive no matter what you're buying. An automobile, you, a, a widget, you all are business people. You know what I'm talking about. And we, we said um, the last time we designed an aircraft carrier was in about the 60s. It takes about 20 years from, from gestation of a great idea and a design until you get one of these out there. That's just the way it is, and it's, there's nothing really unusual about that. So the USS Nimitz, which will, uh, let's see, she'll retire in uh, 2023, and she'll be 50 years old then, so you do the math, uh, and so you see you know, how old she is. So we said, okay, look, we want to be able to uh, do, do more sorties missions from a carrier. We need about a third more of the number of missions. Today we can do about 120 launches and recoveries a day on an aircraft carrier. We wanted to get up closer to 150, so that was one. Two, we do steam catapult, and we have this wire that arrests it. You know, you hook a wire, right? And we said, come on, that's 30s technology. We want to transform into the future. So now we will launch planes from electromagnetic. And the idea is you don't have a bunch of steam piping, uh, and in the long run, you will, you will, in fact, save money. And we have a more advanced arresting gear. You can more quickly capture an aircraft. You don't have to change wires out. I mean, it, it's all about um, being more efficient. We, to man an aircraft carrier today, it's about 3,500 people. They are, in fact, little cities. And so we said, that's people. Man, that's money. Each person in the Navy costs roughly, when you take all the amateurization of you know, their... their uh, their entitlements, about $100,000 a person. And we said, wow, we want to reduce that. So the, the number of people manning that is down by about 25%. So you have that much less. We wanted more sensors and we wanted, you know, the island on the aircraft carrier, if we can shrink that up to maybe about a half of what we had, better radars to be able to defend itself against cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. So we put that on. When you get all that up and it's the first of a kind, uh, there were some mistakes made on, on uh, sequencing technology and sequencing installs. You had one heck of an overrun. Uh, and we can't do that on the second carrier, the John F. Kennedy. Uh, all the design is done for the Kennedy, so that's good because you're working off stable designs. We have stopped changing what we're going to put in the Kennedy, so that's good. Uh, we're going to, we, there are a hundred different sections that are put together. You, you put them together up uh, out there on the on the ways, if you will, ashore. And you lift it with this giant crane and you put it in the dry dock and you actually kind of weld it in. And so you want to put much, much more of the internals uh, uh, in, this, in the, each section. So we're doing that. Reduce the number of sections. I, I think you get my point here. So we're looking at uh, at least a, a 15 to 20% reduction in cost here. We have to do that. We cannot afford to a uh, cost overrun like that. But there was a lot of transformation, a lot of dramatic changes. Uh, one core, uh, as a, so it won't be refueled, and, and also um, 
50 year life, same as the Nimitz class carrier. We have really neat, cool uh, fighter planes that cruise supersonically and are stealth and cost a mint. At the same time, we have already have air superiority without them. Whenever I read about the debate concerning whether it's necessary to have even neater, cooler planes, I hear, well, um, we have air superiority now, but the Chinese are developing uh, superior aircraft, so we need it for that purpose. But I cannot envision any scenario in which the United States and China shoot bullets at one another, um, both because they're so tied economically yeah. and because they're both <coughs> nuclear superpowers. And I want to know whether you can envision <coughs> any, any scenario in which there would be a hot war between our countries. Well, I'm, I'm a little bit where you are. Uh, we're pretty connected um, economically ourselves and the Chinese and I, I uh, let me go if I may go to the aircraft kind of piece uh, a lot of people may think it's air to air you know mano a mano up there doing a dog fight I tell you what those days are pretty far gone because the distance is amazing I, I'd be very unlikely you'll ever see your adversary up there in the sky uh, it is stealth is necessary but it isn't really what one particular country has because the technology is being proliferated around the world on very, very high-end anti-air systems. Syria has some very high-end uh, anti-air systems they bought from Russia. And it's about a very high-resolution radar that can see pretty far out there and track things. And so you either have to shoot a weapon from way off before you get detected, or you're going to get detected, and you're going to get tracked, and they're going to shoot a missile, and then you're going to have to have countermeasures to counter that. So it, it's the world we live in. We are, as I said, hyper-connected, and that's the good news for economies. The bad news is for things sold on the black market and, and weapon sales, hey, they're going all around the world. And it is a matter of high-resolution radar, different bands, frequencies in there. So when I was talking about the electromagnetic spectrum, and getting uh, good in that. That's what I'm talking about, to be able to defeat uh, a lot of different radars. So uh, it, it's, it's more than, it's, it's really not against one country. It's to be able to stay ahead of the threat and, and its proliferation out around the world. Uh, I today don't really see, I can't, it, w it would be a mistake that I think our respective uh, militaries and and countries would make for us to actually get in conflict, I think, with China. And that's something that I'm very comfortable neither one of us wants. And we're working very hard to preclude. Uh, I met with my counterpart, one last thing, uh, Chinese Chief of the Navy, uh, Admiral Wu Sheng Li, about, uh, about a month and a half ago. And we talked a great deal about uh, how to prevent miscalculation among our, our folks who were out there driving our ships and flying our aircraft. Yes, sir. Welcome. Let me ask you, from what you say, the emphasis is going to be on the Navy, not on the Army. I hear and read about reducing the Army strength to 380,000. Am I correct? Would you comment on that? Yeah, that number is uh, one of, of, a, of a series of numbers that are thrown out. The Army uh, of, uh, that we built not long ago was about 480,000. So I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we want to do ground operations in the future, and can we control that not doing ground operations in the future and occupying some place out there that requires a stability operation? And if the answer to that is no, yes, we can control that, and yes, we understand that, then we will size accordingly. And that's the debate we're having in the Pentagon right now. What is the right size? Um, how much, what, let me just put it another way before we say the right size. What do we want to do with the Army, and what do we expect from our Army, and, and do we have that choice as we look out in the future? Because we don't want to make a mistake and reduce the Army below a level that can be effective. Echoing the sentiment of thank you for your service, as well as the other military personnel here, thank you. 
Um, I'm wondering just kind of from a, you know, a quid pro quo standpoint, while, you know, I understand that our deployment in, improves by virtue of our being positioned in some of these forward positions, and you mentioned Spain, et cetera, but is there a time in America where we understand that our budgetary constraints are such that, you know, there has to be something we get in return for that? Um, I know it was, it's been mentioned in some of the debates, but I've never really gotten my mind around if Spain says we'd like you here or if the United Arab Emirates does, you know, do we ever get anything in return for those relationships? I see. It, allied relationships, right? Uh, well, we get, we get, there's some very dependable uh, information sharing, uh, very dependable. The NATO uh, alliance is evolving uh, very much to quite effective in counter piracy, quite effective in uh, deployments that are done in the Gulf of Aden in the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, uh, our Japanese alliance is uh, maturing in leaps and bounds uh, from both the undersea domain uh, on the sea, very, very dependable ally. Uh, Korean, very dependable ally. Uh, they are still determined to finding out, you know, how far they want to go. So there are, there are those that say, hey, look, we don't get enough for our return, and I don't disagree with that per se, but uh, there's a pragmatism of of diplomacy, of uh, how much they can give, because they too, there are many hurting economies out there. So uh, we got to keep plugging away at it, uh, is my view. Uh, be there, uh, assure them, bring them in, nurture them. Don't uh, go so high tech that they, they can't keep up, because then you don't have a partner you know, in that regard. And there's an amazing synergy of deterrence you know, when, when we are steaming together with an ally, you know, you kind of see those pictures every now and again, but they're quite effective of the different flags of the different nations out there together. Uh, so it's not, it's not optimal. Um, I, you know, I turn frequently to our policy people in the Department of Defense and say, you know, you need to, to help us get the weapon sales right. You know, they should be buying our stuff, staying connected to us, you know what I mean? Raise up their their uh, combat system so that we can stay connected. Uh, but it's, uh, I think it's a, uh, a job that we're going to have for as far out as I can see. Thank you, Terry. Appreciate it very much. Admiral, thank you so much for those very insightful comments. Uh, thank you for helping out in the Philippines. Great that the Navy can be there. And those literal combat ships look so cool. My nine-year-old son would love one if you can organize that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. We'll see a lot of you on Monday night for Elon Musk. Thank you so much and good day.